<laughs> the more I do it, the weirder this gets. This is a crazy illusion. This pattern will actually make objects vanish to you. I know you don't believe me, so you're gonna have to try it. Here, take a look at this, you two. Stare at that green dot. Focus on the green dot. And you'll start to notice that the objects in your peripheral will start to vanish. But as soon as you refocus your eye, they're back. Here, try it again. Refocus your eye. That's right. They never went anywhere. Now this is an illusion that's found in perceptual psychology known as motion-induced blindness. It's kind of like a trick of the eye and a trick of the mind where an object will actually vanish even though that stimuli is in plain sight. Never gets old though. Even though this illusion was discovered in 1991 by V.S. Ramachandran and Gregory who are two brilliant neuroscientists, even though they discovered the illusion, we still don't know exactly why this illusion is working. That's right, this is an impossible science going on right now. Now, there are four theories about why this illusion is working. The first one has to do with parts of your eye are being suppressed and so therefore it deletes objects. The other one has to do with the idea that your, all your attention is focusing on the moving objects. But my two favorite ones have to do with your blind spot. That's the spot where your optical nerve attaches to the back of your eyeball. And that's where there's no light receiving cells. And because of that, your eye can't see that spot. There's actually a spot in your vision that your brain is constantly filling in. Now, one of the theories behind this illusion is that it defies logic and so your brain deletes the foreground objects, meaning uh, there's no way an object could be sitting on a moving background. For me, that doesn't make sense because you could totally have something on a piece of glass. So I decided to put my theory to the test, using it to see if I could replicate the animated pattern you saw at the beginning, but this time in the physical world. I'm gonna use the Sony Couve. Uh, it's super great. If you haven't seen me use this before, uh, the Couve is fantastic for prototyping objects. You just upload your programs to it and uh, yeah, you can build anything with it. So let's give it a shot. So if this is true, the thin sheet of glass shouldn't distract from your eyes and the effect will take place and the objects will vanish. This also means that if you happen to come across a moving background with a stationary object in front of it, the object could actually vanish right before your eyes. Oh, I'm pretty excited because I know this is gonna work. I, I, I'm, or at least I'm feeling pretty confident this thing's gonna vanish immediately. Wow, as soon as this thing starts spinning, my brain is trying to process all those moving squares and that is a lot. But there is a flaw to my plan. See, these pieces are actually uh, uh, translucent. So as the dark line goes behind it, it's actually blinking to me. I need to switch that out to something that doesn't blink. I'm gonna use a metal silver bolt. And I have a feeling this is gonna look great. Yeah, that totally works. So if this is true, the thin sheet of glass shouldn't distract from your eyes and the effect will take place and the objects will vanish. This also means that if you happen to come across a moving background with a stationary object in front of it, the object could actually vanish right before your eyes. What's going on? No ghosts in my hallway. And it's actually an illusion called Pepper's Ghost. This is a giant sheet of plexiglass that I got from the hardware store and my friends at Ghostbusters helped me out with this. This is the animation of Bug Eye from the movie. It's playing on a TV set, but because the reflection is on this 45 degree angled plexiglass, you're actually seeing through it, which is why it looks transparent. But assuming you don't have a giant sheet of plexiglass or the friends of Ghostbusters, don't worry, I got you. I'm gonna show you how to make an illusion with just your phone and some cellophane. Check this out. So how do we see objects? And how do we use that knowledge to see a ghost? We see objects because light rays scatter from objects and enter our eyes. When light rays reflect off a mirror, almost all the light rays are bounced back to our eyes, so we see bright images. When we bounce light off a transparent material such as glass or plexiglass, only a portion of that light is reflected back to our eyes, which is why the image does not appear bright. Combine the light being reflected off the surface of the glass with the light coming through the glass from the original background, and ta-da, you have a transparent ghost. Okay, so you don't have a giant piece of acrylic and you don't have a giant screen to put a ghost in your hallway. Well, don't worry, I'm gonna show you how to make a ghost appear on your phone. Yeah, and it's not gonna be any ghost. It's gonna be Muncher from the new movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife. So, let's get started. Now, let me show you how to make this ghost. Or in this case, I'm actually gonna show you how to make a hologram because the ghost you're about to make, you can see from all sides. Now, you're gonna need a smartphone. We're gonna need some paper, some plastic. You're gonna to wanna to be able to see through it. So if it's cloudy, you don't really want that one. All right, you're gonna need some scissors, a marker, some clear tape, and a ruler. All right, this is what you need to do. You need to draw a trapezoid that's drawn to be 60 millimeters 
by 35 millimeters by 10 millimeters. And if you draw this line and this one in the center and this one on center, then if you just connect these corners, you're good. Now we're gonna need four of these cut out of this piece of plastic. I'm gonna lay the plastic on it. I'm just gonna use a marker to actually stencil out this trapezoid. Just connect these here. All right, so now we're just gonna stencil out these. And we're done. Now you just have four of these trapezoids traced out onto this plastic and we just have to cut them out. Now, if you really want this to look good, you wanna make sure you cut off these little black edges that you had left with your marker. Uh, I wanted to make sure you could see them but so I'm gonna cut them off now. All right, so now what you wanna do is take these pieces and you wanna tape them together like this because we're gonna be making a pyramid out of the plastic. So just like this, just afterwards. And we're gonna repeat with all the pieces. When you're done taping all four of them together, you'll have a piece that looks like this. Don't worry, that's exactly how it's supposed to look because if you bend it together like this, we're gonna end up taping this last piece together and then you get your pyramid. And that's it. All you need to do is make this little pyramid. Now, go to the link below and play the video on the phone. Now all you have to do is take your pyramid and place it right here on your phone. Now I'm gonna put a little bit of tack in the center so I can actually handle the phone so it doesn't fall off. But if you get it balanced, you don't need any, anything like that. But you can see that's how it goes. Now, once you hit play, Muncher is playing from four different angles. And if you spin your phone, you can actually see him from four different angles. Pepper's Ghost, just times four. How cool is that? Now let's say you don't have photo editing software. Well, I got you. I'm gonna show you how to draw an anamorphic image. Now I scoured the internet and found a super simple way to do it. And you're just gonna need a few items. You're gonna need some paper, a pencil, a regular marker. I'm gonna use a Sharpie here. A regular marker, a fine tip marker, and I'm gonna be using straight edge. Actually, I'm using a triangle for this one. To do this, I'm gonna draw a four inch by four inch square. Now I'm using this triangle because that will give me my right angles. And if I do this right, we're gonna end up having a drawing that looks like there's a hole in the table. So you have a square. Now just connect the diagonal. And then we're gonna be making a couple of L's. I'm also drawing this upside down compared to what you guys need to be doing on your side. So hopefully it'll look better for you than it does for me. Upside down, it's kind of confusing. This probably doesn't look like much yet. That's just because these are just lines and shapes right now. Not that exciting. But as we start to add in the shading and give it perspective, or give it this perspective, it's gonna look more and more three-dimensional. So this next layer is, we're gonna use the fine tip marker. We're gonna make straight edge here and here. This will be the edge of our pit into the table. Which makes sense because when you can see something up close, it's very defined. And that's what this straight edge is doing. I was never good at drawing, so I always wanted to take my time, which is funny because I'm rushing right now. All right, next step, take your marker with a wider tip on it, and we're gonna end up drawing out these lines. Don't draw the diagonal, just the lines. Now try not to break that line up there even though I did a little bit there. And what I mean by that is don't go over it. Okay, now the next step is we're gonna fill these in. I'm gonna start off with this square over here and you'll see why I made that square because that's gonna be the pit. That's gonna be where, where it kind of gets hard to see what's going on as far as perspective wise right now. But we're just gonna fill in this spot. Again, you wanna stay within the lines 
So take your time on the edges here. And then you can go a little bit faster after you have those edges defined. Find. And then we're gonna alternate and we're gonna make a black stripe up here. Now I'm doing the edge first so that I can go a little bit faster after that, but highly recommend doing the edges first. By the way, this is gonna look better on camera than it does in person. And that's because a camera only has, well, the our cameras I'm using only have one lens. Well, you have two eyes. When you're seeing something with your eyes, you're actually seeing it from two different angles. Even though they're in the front of your head, you're actually looking at them from two different points. That allows you to see depth a lot better than with one eye. So with the camera, since it only has one lens to look through, you lose the ability to define depth, specifically with a drawing. It, you can actually really get a drawing to look three-dimensional with a camera because of its one perspective. Remember, anamorphic art only works from one point of view. So even the distance between your eyes, well, that actually is two different angles. All right, so there you're there. Now, just grab a pencil and we're gonna shade in only this side. Now, the side closest to the square at the bottom, we're gonna make that darker. So I'm gonna get this one going here. Get our finger to smudge it around. Now, then we're gonna go from darker to lighter to lightest. So not as much on this one. And there you have it, a pit and table. Now, <laughs> I know there's, it may not be perfect yet. There's probably one angle that's much better than the others for these cameras. So it probably doesn't look very good from that camera because you're looking at it from the wrong point of view. You're actually seeing this wall, which you shouldn't be able to see from that angle. So it's probably gonna be best to be from this angle to look down where you have this edge of the pit. So let me just the, adjust the cameras and let's uh, see how real we can make this thing look. So let me see what we can do here. If I get the right angle for this, this would look 3D. It looks a lot better from this angle than any other angle because from this perspective, you're able to see this wall and this wall, which makes sense versus this angle. Well, you really shouldn't see this wall. So the illusion doesn't work that well from this angle. And from dead on, it might work a little bit, but really you should be able to see a third wall as well. This front edge where the, the fine line is, that's supposed to be the edge of the table. But if you find the right angle, you can actually make it look like it's 3D. Today, we're gonna transform a black and white image into one's full of color. Now, it sounds impossible. In fact, this has been an idea for magic tricks for countless years as we try to find ways to make color appear at our fingertips. And whether it's done with a deck of cards or a magic coloring book, doesn't matter because the real secret behind making color appear turns out this one is possible through science. If we wanna trick the eye, we should know how it works. If we take a closer look at the back of the eye, there's a thin tissue known as the retina. Now the retina is comprised of two different types of photoreceptive cells. There are rods and there's cones. The rods are responsible for detecting different levels of light. And they're also responsible for a vision at nighttime. While the cones, they're responsible for detecting the colors, the red, the greens, and blues in different combinations. Both the rods and the cones work together to send signals down the optical nerve and up to the brain where the brain deciphers those signals to see what we're looking at. Now that we understand the pipeline, well, let's figure out how we can trick it. Okay, we're gonna trick the eye by using what's called an after image. An after image is what happens when you engage the same photoreceptors at the back of the eye for an extended period of time, roughly 20 to 30 seconds. Now, what you don't notice throughout the day is that your photoreceptors in your eye are constantly being adjusted. See, you're constantly focusing on different things. You're looking at different bright lights and different color shades, and those photoreceptors are adjusting. Now, don't think there's only like a few of these things. There's about 90 to 120 million rods in your eye, and there's roughly six or seven million cones in your eye. So you can see there would already be a lot of different adjustments going on throughout the day. But what we wanna do is tire the same photoreceptors out for an extended period of time. So let's do the experiment again, and I'll walk you through what's happening. So here we go. I need you to focus right here. And I'm gonna stay as still as possible as I explain what's happening so that I can engage the same photoreceptors. What's happening right now is the photoreceptors in your eyes, the ones that are seeing the bright lights, are telling the brain that it's seeing bright lights, bright colors. While there's other photoreceptors that are detecting the darker shades and the darker colors. Now they're not working as hard as the ones that are detecting the bright lights. 
the ones that are detecting the bright lights are getting tired. In about 20, 30 seconds of this, they're actually sending a weaker and weaker signal to the brain. The brain is starting to realize this is the new normal. When we switch to black and white, well, the photoreceptors that were not engaged as much the first time are now coming at full strength. And this is very overwhelming to the brain. And the brain instantly thinks it's looking at the negative. So let's give it a shot. And if you blink, you momentarily see color. In fact, you can actually look at a white wall and you should still be able to see color. That's the after image. Pretty crazy when you think about it. See, you can even put this into test. You can actually just look at a color wheel and you can see how our logo even was in the background was changing colors. Anything that was white, the inverse was black. Just as much as those red, greens, and blues that the cones were detecting, um, the cyan in our logo looked like red just as much as green looked like magenta and you can actually see a color wheel in action which i think is pretty cool hey everyone it's jason latimer world champion of magic coming to you with another impossible science the show where we take an impossible topic and we see if we can bring it to life through science now what you just saw the ping pong ball passing through the window that's a magic trick but it made me think there actually is a science experiment where you can pass a solid object through another solid object and it uses depth perception field of view and a project known as the Ames window. So I'm gonna show you how to make an Ames window and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Let's get started. This is the Ames window designed by Adelbert Ames in 1951. This optical illusion uses perspective art and field of view to trick your mind. Now you're probably wondering, wait a second, what do you mean trick my mind? Well, take a close look at this window. Look at the window as it swings from one side to the other side and then back. Take a look at it from another perspective. It's actually rotating at 360 degrees, even if I slow it down. It still looks like it's just gonna sweep back and forth. So right now I'm gonna break down how do you actually make an Ames window and why does it work? The first thing you need to do is take the JPEG I provide you and you can expand it or just move it onto a piece of foam core and cut it out. You want to trace out the lines in black because you want that contrast. You want two different shades of the same color. You want a bright one and a dark one to give you that shading. And you'll notice that since it's not a rectangle, what's going on? Well, this is perspective art. This is the idea of what it would look like on a flat drawing, a 2D drawing, to give you a three-dimensional feel. So when I hold it up like this, it actually looks three-dimensional. Now there's a lot going on right now because with the Ames window, Albert noticed that your mind has been conditioned to actually see right angles. Kind of odd when you think about that, but think about any window you've ever seen. You've seen the bright side, the shaded side, you've seen this format and your mind is constantly seeking out patterns, in this case, the right angle. And it's taking advantage of that with perspective art. If you've ever noticed that things get larger as they get closer, that has to do with what's known as field of view. So let me explain. Field of view has to do with how much you can see without turning or tilting your head. How big an object appears to us has to do with how much our field of view is taken up by that object. And one way to measure our field of view is by angle. Vertically, our field of view is about 150 degrees. If you look at a building from far away and you can see the entire building from top to bottom, if you calculate the angle from the line from your eye to the top of the building and the line from your eye to the bottom of the building, you will find that this angle is small compared to the 150 degrees you have available. The further the object is, the smaller this angle will be. As you move closer, the viewing angle of this building grows. Your brain interprets this larger percentage of your field of view being taken up means that this object is either larger or it must be closer. Our brain is constantly deciphering and reinforcing that a smaller viewing angle means that this object is either physically smaller or farther away. So if we draw a situation where the viewing angle is incorrect on purpose, the brain must choose what to believe. This is the basis of the Ames window. Okay, so now that we understand how to make the template and we understand the field of view and the science of it, how would you actually get it to spin? Well, there's a lot of different ways. One, if you don't happen to have a motor, uh, the low-tech way to do this would be just tie a string from one side to the other. Uh, so once you hang it from something, just twist up the, the cord and then let go. And as it unwinds, it'll rotate and the illusion will take place. For me, when I build stuff, I like to use a Sony Couve. It's like building blocks and engineering and coding all at the same time. See, I wanted something that I could adjust the speeds for. So I just assembled a motor with a controller. I went on the website. 
I actually found, I didn't even code it myself. I said, oh, there's a helicopter. I'm just gonna drag the helicopter code over, Bluetooth it to this, and I'm good to go. So if you're an educator or a maker and you just like prototyping stuff super quick, the Kuv is awesome. How do we make it all come together to make a solid object pass through a solid object? Since we know that the mind thinks that this piece will be in the front at all times, we're gonna give it real dimension. See, we have fake illusion drawing uh, perspective right now, and I'm gonna add a ruler to this. We're gonna make this ruler look like it passes through these bars. So making sure that it stands tall enough so that you can see it pass through the bars really helps this illusion. You, I like a ruler because it's got one side that has writing on it and the other side doesn't. And now what's that do? Well, your mind knows that and as it flips around, it realizes that the ruler is turning. You want your mind to think that the ruler is turning but you want your mind to also think that the window is just going back and forth. So I'm gonna place this right here. And I want you to keep an eye on the side with the numbers on it. Now let me slow it down. And even if it goes really slow, if you take a close look at it, Even when it's going really slow, take a look at the side with the numbers on it and you'll see it pass through the bars on the window. A solid object passing through another solid object. Of course, it's not really a trick. It's an optical illusion. There's no sleight of hand, there's no gimmicks. This is working because your mind is putting it together for you with our understanding of field of view and perspective. Now, I found that the larger this is, the farther you have to be away from it. So when I first drew this, it wasn't gonna work right here in my little studio because I couldn't get the camera far enough away from it. So I shrunk down the image for it to work better. And the closer you get to it, the more your eyes help you out. Your eyes are actually looking at something from two different angles. And because of that, as you get closer to something, you can actually see it from two different angles and so you can understand depth better. But if you pull the object farther away, your eyes are now looking more along a parallel line, or at least closer to a parallel line, and, and because of that, you lose your depth.